I also would like to extend my welcome to those who are present this morning, especially if you're visiting with us. The topic that I've chosen this morning arguably is a very controversial one. Uh, it is, for some people, uh, a very personal uh, topic, can be a very touchy topic. Uh, within our culture, uh, some aspects of it have some very, uh, I'll call them negative connotations. And as such, it can be a, a very uh, um, uncomfortable topic. Uh, including when, when talked about from the pulpit. In fact, I was trying to remember in over roughly 40 years of listening to sermons, honestly, I don't recall this having ever been addressed ever, ever. The topic is gluttony. And as I said, the word, even of itself, can trigger just all kinds of like negative reactions. In fact, within our culture, you may have heard the you know children's nursery rhyme. You know, Jack Spratt could eat no fat; his wife could eat no lean. And I put that in Google. Came up with with this image here. And within our culture, there's all kinds of um, I'll say connotations, uh, words, descriptions, adjectives, etc. You know, to include things like being overweight. Or chunky, heavy, chubby, plump, fat, fat so, and, and others, and it, and many more that go even worse than that. On one side, right? You go on the other side, slim, slender, okay, skinny, gaunt, scrawny, bony, bean pole like a rail, etc. Right on the other side. Now, you look at these two lists, and two things, to me at least, jump right out at you. One is, notice, and it isn't fair, but it is in our culture. <clears throat> Lots over here, not that many over here, right? And, and you go on the internet and you look up uh, synonyms, you know, not too many here, Lots and lots and lots and lots here. And some that you may have heard in school when kids are cruel and all that kind of stuff. The other thing, if you'll notice, look at the connotation. I mean, this is almost like um, sympathy kind of thing for a person that fits that kind of description. Over here, uh, you don't see any sympathy at all, do you? Very negative connotation. So what we want to talk about today is is not not just gluttony. I mean, we want we want to talk about you know what the Bible has to say about food in general, with some special emphasis on gluttony. And we've already talked about negative connotations. We'll talk about some of the challenges that we face uh, in our society, uh, some of the resulting problems based on those challenges in our society, weight related problems. Gluttony also has a lot and food, but more specifically gluttony, uh, has some misconceptions, misunderstandings. We want to address those briefly. We want to see a little bit about what the Bible says about food, and it's got quite a bit, as, as we'll see. We want to actually go in and look at some of the contexts and see what we, what we can learn from them, as well as some of the Bible definitions. Uh, also want to look at some general principles, more, more general related principles around food and gluttony, etc. Uh, see how we can make potential applications, uh, look at some Bible examples, look at some warning signs that kind of should alert us, and in general look at how to overcome what I might call food-related temptations. Now, a couple quick notes here before we move off of this uh, agenda slide, if you will. A, a lot of different aspects, a lot of different aspects <coughs> versus perspectives, etc., uh, as you could kind of get from this list. And really, I have probably more than one sermon's worth of material. I don't know if it's like a sermon and a half or maybe two. So we'll probably be stopping kind of partway through here uh, and reserving the, the second half for a later lesson. 
Uh, let me talk to Al and I'll find out when might be a good time to do that. The other thing is because this can be a very sensitive topic, uh, I'm going to be, I will try to use words very carefully. Okay, I don't want to unnecessarily, you know, offend, you know, anyone here or anyone who might be, you know, watching the tape or listening to the audio. Uh, but if there's some aspects that I leave out and, and you want to, you know, that I've just overlooked, didn't consider, you know, please bring to my attention. Uh, and like I said, I, I, I will try to be, you know, careful how I say things, but, it, you know, if, if, if I say something that's not appropriate, please let me know. Again, I don't mean to you know, unnecessarily, you know, cause offense. Because indeed, it's, it's a touchy, it's a very touchy subject. Like I said, have never heard it uh, in my memory uh, talked about from the, from the pulpit. So off we go. So within our modern society, first of all, as we've kind of mentioned with, with some cultures, third world countries, uh, you know, a, a lack of food. So here in this country, not a problem, right? I mean, we typically have well-stocked pantries in our homes. We've got refrigerators, we've got freezers, uh, et cetera. Uh, probably within a few minutes driving, we have supermarkets. And when we say supermarkets, they are really super <laughs> in terms of you know, varieties of, of food, and, uh, et cetera, you know, fresh, frozen, packaged, et cetera. You know, restaurants within five, I mean, it's almost like a restaurant on every corner within our culture. <laughs> And with restaurants, for example, and even with some of the you know, packaged food in supermarkets, you know, the portion size is very generous. I mean, there was one restaurant I remember us eating at uh, many years ago uh, that I won't necessarily mention the name. But, you know, you order a meal and it, it's like <clears throat> comes out on this big plate. And if you happen to also order dessert, you know, their desserts were like huge, you know, portion size. It's, it's interesting that within our culture, some of the uh, restaurants, um, I don't know about sit-down restaurants, but more fast food restaurants, you know, started listing uh, some of the calorie counts for, you know, this meal or, you know, for this entree or this entree if you make it a meal or, you know, sodas or fries or, or whatever. Okay. Easy access. Food is everywhere in abundance. It's also embedded throughout our culture. You know, advertisement on you know, TV, uh, snacks in the workplace. In fact, where I work, there's uh, not only vending machines you know, out in the hallways, but different programs will actually have a, a snack area where you know, program people will you know, bring in uh, you know, various you know, cookies and chips and, and other things. You know, certainly with holiday seasons, particularly you know, Thanksgiving, Christmas coming up, which I sometimes refer to as the eating season, you know, very heavily you know, embedded within our culture. Also within our culture, within a lot of the food we eat, uh, it is engineered, and I use that term uh, inten intentionally, engineered to appeal, right? Because the more appealing you make it, the more product you'll sell. Okay, understandable. And so a lot of our foods are... are what I might call calorie dense, you know, small amount, has a lot of, uh, you know, good tasting stuff to it that is achieved by fat, sugar, flavoring, color, packaging, etc. Very appealing, as, as to be expected. And throw on top of all of that, generally speaking, we as a culture, live somewhat sedentary lifestyle. I mean, it's not like we're on the farm every day, you know, expending a lot of labor to, you know, plant crops and harvest them or take care of animals or whatever. You know, a lot of us work in quote-unquote office environments, sitting around eight hours a day, right? Uh, and when I say eight hours, it's like we also have a lot of leisure time also to sit around, <laughs> And we have a lot of things that uh, will, you know, help us spend our time that are also somewhat sedentary. You know, watching TV, playing video games, etc. So we almost have, you know, all these different factors here that are kind of, on the one hand, 
are somewhat blessings to some degree. I mean, I would rather have a well-stocked supermarket than not. Right? Like with some third world countries, or you see some supermarkets that are in like a hurricane zones, and there's been a run on the supermarket and the shelves are empty. Well, that's that's, that's not good. Uh, certainly enjoy a lot of our modern foods. And, and certainly enjoys a lot of our modern convenience. So in some ways it's a blessing, kind of. But, as you may well know, it's resulted in a lot of problems. Okay? To include, and I'm not certain how much this includes, how about $66 billion spent on, quote-unquote, dieting, diet aids, diet program, I don't know if they throw diet soda in there or not, but it could very well be. You know, weight loss surgery, etc. More so on top of that, there's you know, rising concerns over health food or healthy food or organic food, uh, genetically modified organisms, you know, being introduced into our food supply, and a lot of concern there as well. We're also seeing quote unquote psychological problems with some people in extreme cases. Of those that have a very um, uh, negative, quote unquote, body image, uh, to include you know something called anorexia, which is like obsessing about weight, minimizing weight, minimizing calorie, minimizing weight, eating. basically self-starvation in some extreme cases, or, or the in some ways the other extreme, bulimia, which is like I'm going to eat, 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 and then throw it up. And then eat, 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 uh, again. Uh, the other uh, big aspect within, within our culture, quote unquote, an obesity ep epidemic. Now, in this context, obesity has a medical definition. It's related to body mass index. It's related to the percentage of your body that's you know, fat tissue as opposed to you know, non-fat tissue, etc. But the most recent numbers, at least I was able to find on the internet, about a third in the U.S., about a third of all adults in the U.S. cross this threshold of what you know, medical science is calling obese. And of course, even beyond that, there's something called morbidly obese, even higher percentages. What's interesting is 15 to 20 percent of children now are suffering from this. And it's not just weight. It's not just extra weight. But there's all kinds of other things associated with it, like heart disease, blood pressure, diabetes, sleep apnea, uh, arthritis, joint problems, etc. It's health-wise, it, it's it's a big deal, big problem, big problem in our society. I went out on the internet and saw some different statistics, and I thought I would, you know, pull this one in. Now you might not be able to see the numbers, but you can hopefully see the colors. The the top part basically shows from 1994 forward roughly 20 years, give or take, the percentage of adults in the U.S. that are quote-unquote obese. Again, body mass index over, and according to numbers here, about uh, 30 kilograms per square, it's scientific kind of thing. Anyway, according to the scientific definition. And right away, you can see over a process of about 20 years that things have gotten much worse. You know, basically the red is showing, you know, higher percentages. You know, the, the lighter orange, yellow uh, is lower percentages. So, and it's not, not in any one state. I mean, it's like across the nation. Uh, it's not really in any one region anymore. Now, the good news, if I could call it good news, there's Colorado. You know, we're kind of standing out there. You know, we, it's interesting. We tend to, in this state, have a little more healthier lifestyle, quote unquote. I mean, you know, we have the mountains, we have lots of sunshine, people like being outdoors, or maybe, you know, people drawn to the state for those kinds of things, etc. But, you know, even here, you know, small island of, well, I can't really say success because that number is, you know, pretty high as well, but just in terms of raw numbers. The other reason I wanted to include the chart, they did the same thing, same years, now for diabetes. And you can see the immediate trend. You know, as obesity goes up, diabetes goes up. 
shouldn't be too surprised. I mean, I'm not a doctor, but from my limited understanding is, you know, the more weight that you have, the more you tend to have problems with, you know, blood pressure, the more stress it puts on the system, the more stress it puts on the hormonal glands, etc. and type 2 diabetes, early onset diabetes for adults, you know, tends to go along with that as well. So it's not surprising that as the nation has become more and more, quote unquote, clinically obese, that rates of diabetes have gone up as well. Serious man. The other thing is, it, in our culture, it is such an easy, easy, quote unquote, trap to fall into. There's, there's a lot of things in, in the food industry now about, uh, you know, low calorie snacks. 100 calories, 80 calories, uh, sometimes little packets, whatever. And there's all different kinds. I mean, there's quote unquote healthy kinds of quote unquote low calorie snacks. There's also all kinds of, I don't, I don't want to necessarily say non healthy, but you know, tasty ones <laughs> for sure. Uh, and admittedly, some of these packs are, you know, <clears throat> they're not that really big. I mean, I've seen, you know, yay big. There's a few things inside. And if you blink, if you start to eat them and you get distracted, it's like, whoa, where'd they go? Not that much. 100 calories, right? 100 calories is not that many. Okay. <clears throat> Quote, unquote, it's only 100 calories, right? Now, what I'm about to say, I don't, I'll, I'll confess right up front. <clears throat> I don't know if it's true biologically, but I do know it's true mathematically. Okay, because I know the body is a wonderful mechanism created by God and has all different kinds of self-regulating uh, mechanisms, feedback mechanisms, etc. So what I'm about to say may not completely apply, but at least mathematically, it makes sense. 100 calories. <coughs> so let's run the numbers. One snack a day. Okay? You know, one extra banana, two cups of carrots. Uh, I don't know, me personally, I kind of like these. Those fudge stripes look pretty good. Of course, you might only get two. Oreo cookies, you know, 100 calories, Oreo cookies. That's like two. And I'm not talking the double stuffed, right? Just two. Anyway, 100, 100 extra calories a day. Not that big a deal. Run the numbers. 36,000 calories a year. Ooh. Yeah. How many calories in a pound of fat? Yeah. According to the internet, about 3,000, 3,000 and a half, 3,500. Give or take. Okay, do the math. That's roughly 10 extra pounds a year. 10 pounds. Yeah, that, that's not too bad. Go forward five years. That's 50 pounds. <coughs> Again, don't know if the biology supports that or not, but at least mathematically. You know, and that's why it's such an easy trap to fall into. You know, who would ever think, you know, 100 calorie snack? Okay, no big deal. In fact, they're promoted, right? And there, there's a place where I'm not saying snacks are simple. I'm not saying that at all. But something as simple as 100 extra calories added over time turns into some quite a bit of weight. <clears throat> Math, at least ma again, at least mathematically. And there's all kinds of misconceptions about quote-unquote gluttony. I mean, you say the term, and people start thinking, oh, well, that means, well, does it? Does it? Okay. Number one, being overweight. Does that mean you're glutton? As we'll see later on in the lesson, the answer is not necessarily. Because there's a number of factors that have to be considered. How about just eating a big meal? Is that gluttony? Not necessarily. How about eating food that is quote unquote too rich? And I don't mean price wise. I mean you know sauces and flavorings and etc. Uh, what some people might say you know living high on the hog, for instance, is that gluttony? How about food that is too expensive? Or too exotic. I mean, you think in terms of, I don't know, caviar and escargot, snails, eh, no thank you. Uh, or, and hopefully this does not fall into that category, bacon wrapped filet mignon, which is very tasty. Is gluttony eating too quickly or gobbling your food down? Some people think that's what gluttony is. Some people think gluttony is, well, eating too early. Now you may, that one may strike people as going, what? Too early? Well, part of these misconceptions comes, believe it or not, from the Middle Ages. When 
gluttony was characterized by the Catholic Church, by Catholicism, as quote-unquote one of the seven deadly sins. Now, if you think back to Middle Ages, Dark Ages, etc., hard times, most people being uh, in service to you know the king or castle, etc., the bubonic plague, all kinds of problems, right? All kinds of problems, including having an unreliable food supply. So within that culture, you know, any it was perceived, you know, anyone that had access to a big meal or rich sauces or something that was expensive or just gobbling down as much as you could, whatever, was was viewed as a glutton. Which, within the context of the culture, kind of makes sense. The other thing is it is often associated with something called asceticism. Um, I think in one of Alan's classes where he's talking about uh, going through First John, you may remember the Gnostics, and a couple of different varieties of Gnostics. Uh, you may also remember from that class the on the Greek side of the house, the Stoics and the Epicureans. And of course, the Stoics with some of the Gnostics had this negative image about um, the body, material things, uh, enjoying life, enjoying your senses, etc. Uh, and kind of wrapped all together, viewed you know food, you know above the bare essentials as being something to be avoided. Right? So a lot of that has carried over into our modern culture. Right? We're simply having extra weight or access to a big meal, or eating something that happens to be expensive, whatever. Oh, well, that's, that's oh, I don't know if that's right. That, must be, that, that sounds like that's gluttony. Well, as we'll see later on, at least from a biblical perspective, <clears throat> eh, no, not necessarily, not necessarily at all. And, to kind of cap it, cap this part of our discussion, we see that in our modern definitions. Again, modern definitions. So we go to Merriam-Webster, And this is a snippet of what they had to say. Habitual greed or excess in eating. Greedy or excessive indulgence. Uh, I like uh, Wikipedia a little bit better. You know, glutton. Well, that's not really a Greek term. That's a Latin term, which I thought was interesting. Derived from the Latin to gulp. To gulp down or to swallow. Uh, At least according to Wikipedia. Overindulgence, overconsumption of food drink or wealth items. Hmm, gluttony? I thought gluttony was just associated with food. Well, modern definition, not necessarily. Uh, in fact, sometimes we, we use the phrase, boy, that, that guy is certainly a glutton for punishment. <laughs> right? You know, for uh, excessive <laughs> whatever, getting into trouble, etc. Uh, but the real question that, that we want to focus on in, in a little bit of the time we've got today what does the Bible say? Okay. Not just gluttony, but in general, about Christians living right, eating food, eating and food, with some special emphasis on quote unquote what the Bible defines as gluttony. So let's talk about some good aspects first. Blessing from God. Okay. So we understand that our senses, since we're created by God. Our senses are created by God, right? And at least with respect to eating, just about all of our senses are engaged, right? Taste, for sure. Smell? Oh, yeah. I mean, if you're hungry and you go past like a restaurant or something? Yep, yep. Sight? Texture? Touch? I mean, if if you don't think like texture and touch is involved, then just try eating pureed something. And that's all you're eating is just something that's pureed. No, no, no touch, no texture. It's like, yeah. Baby food, classic example. You know, 1 Corinthians 6, verse 13. You know, the food is for the stomach, stomach is for the food. It's its, it's natural, um, you know, God-given purpose. Right? Senses, food, digestion, etc. Uh, it's, it's a blessing from God. Certainly, in addition to that, with creation... As you can read back in Genesis chapter, I think for a second, two, one, two, somewhere in there. Uh, Everything created very good. 
all kind of abundance of plants originally given to <coughs> mankind and animals to eat, you know, vegetarian kind of thing. Of course, you go on over to Genesis chapter, I think it's 8, Genesis chapter 9, somewhere in there, where, you know, meat is added. Uh, and so having, you know, appetizing food, again, it's a blessing from God. We have commands to enjoy it. I mean, uh, for example, uh, under the Old Testament law, Leviticus chapter 23, talks about having feasts of, you know, food and such, uh, thankfulness to God for, for the bountiful, bountiful, bountiful blessings of food. Again, blessing from God. Uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 24. Um, it's also echoed in chapter 313, 518. Uh Nothing better for a man. He should eat, eat and drink, and that he should make his soul enjoy the good of his labor. This also I saw that it was from the hand of God. Right? Again, it's a blessing. Uh, 1 Timothy 4, 3. In contrast to that, as you read within the context, there are some people, and I don't know if this was like, again, from a Gnostic's perspective, you know, commanding people to abstain from this and abstain from that, etc. You know, they would abstain or command people, order people to abstain from certain foods, which, look at it, God created to be received thanksgiving, with thanksgiving, by those who believe and know the truth. Again, blessings from God. And yet, there's a danger. Okay? Genesis 3. What was one of the aspects at the very core or center of the temptation of Eve? and the fall. Desire for the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. In fact, uh, parallels are made over in the New Testament. You know, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes. So in some ways, food was, quote-unquote, at the center of the fall. Genesis chapter 3. We also see it associated with Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, whenever I say Sodom and Gomorrah, most people will say, oh, right, homosexuality, gang rape, right? men having sex with men, Sodom and Gomorrah, right? And you make that natural association. And that's true. That is true. But if you look over in Ezekiel chapter 16, verses 49, there's a couple other things that were going on at the time. Um... And I can't remember off the top of my head if it talks about having leisure time or not, uh, or, or disposable time or whatever. But excess of food was, or quote unquote, gluttony. Now, what's kind of interesting is if you look at Sodom and Gomorrah, and if indeed they did have a society that had enough leisure time to you know, indulge in food, as well as some of these, you know, sexual perversions. Interesting parallel with our modern culture, isn't it? Something to think about. Proverbs 23, verse 2. When thou sittest to eat with a ruler, consider diligently what is set before thee, or what is before thee. Put a knife to your throat if you're a man given to appetite. A warning. How about Proverbs 25, verses 16? Have you found honey? Now, honestly, I don't remember off the top of my head if the Jews uh, cultivated honey to beekeeping. They may have. Uh, but certainly there were wild bees, uh, wild honeycomb, etc. You may recall, uh, I think it was uh, Samson uh, had association with that degree. Anyway, have you found honey? Hey, that's a good deal. That's natural sugar, sweet, great, appetite. Taste buds, whatever. Eat so much as is sufficient for thee, lest thou be filled therewith. And basically get sick to your stomach because you know, it's too sweet. Too sweet, too much, etc. Again, a warning. Romans 14. You know how? Wrapped within the general context of meat sacrificed to idols. Uh, and Paul in some way said, you know, it's just meat. Doesn't really matter. Right? Sacrifice an idol, but an idol's nothing. But... Be careful. Don't you insist on eating it. Again, food, a food kind of problem. Don't you insist on eating it if it causes some other people to stumble, cause your brother to 
Think, well, maybe it's okay. I don't know if it's okay or not, but I guess I'll go ahead and do it. Eh, violate his conscience, etc. Again, a warning there. What I did to kind of move into the, the next part of our topic, um, went through, I can't remember which version, it might have been King James. And I said, okay, we've got this term. We see some warnings about food in general, but what about this gluttony thing? Okay. So I looked up glutton, gluttons, uh, gluttonous, gluttony, you know, as many different you know, synonyms as I could find, uh, and, and found some context I'll share with you here. Uh, first of all, you know, the good news, at least within, I think, King James, uh, the word gluttony, not in the Bible. Okay, fine. But there are adjectives and other nouns that, that are there. Okay. Deuteronomy 21, 20. We'll start there. Uh, parents bringing their child to the elders of the city. You may remember the context. Okay. And here's the charge. Our son is stubborn, rebellious, not obey, glutton, drunkard. Okay. And, and basically what I want to do here is, at least on this particular chart, there's like three main contexts in this first part one or two. Uh, we'll show each one, and then we'll kind of make some comments about each. Okay, here comes another one, Proverbs 23, verses 20 and 21. Be not among <coughs> wine bibbers, among gluttonous eaters of flesh, for the drunkard and the glutton shall come to poverty. Proverbs 28, 7. Whosoever keepeth the law is a wise son, but he that is a companion of gluttons shameth his father. Okay, so if you look at the context, what can you get from the context? Well, oh, sorry, one more. Uh, Matthew 11, uh, 16 through 19, likewise Luke 7. Now, if you remember the context, I think the Pharisee, uh, Jesus is charging the, the Pharisees with being you know, somewhat hypocritical. And he says, hey, here comes John the Baptist. And he, quote unquote, does not eat or drink. And you Pharisees accuse him of having a demon. Son of man, Jesus, comes, quote unquote, eating, drinking. And now you're going to accuse him of being, you know, gluttonous and a wine bearer. You know, excessive giving to wine. Now, did John the Baptist not eat? Well, that's not true. Now, did he have normal food, social kind of thing? Well, evidently not. If you remember the context, uh, can't remember the scripture off the top of my head, locusts and wild honey. Right? Somewhat unusual, but he ate. Right? So the chart, the, this, this phrase of you know, not eating, drinking, is not total abstinence from food or drink for, for decades, but not normal social food of the time, etc. And here comes Jesus eating the normal social food of the time. And they're going to accuse him of being, you know, gluttonous and a wine river. Interesting contrast. So what can we learn from these? Well, here's here's kind of a challenge, honestly. You look at the context, and it's really hard to tell what I mean if you didn't know what that word meant, you wouldn't really know what the word meant, right? I mean it's in a context of being stubborn or rebellious. Uh, it's in a context of being drunk, but by itself, eh, hard to tell what it means. You know, likewise, you go on to the next passage here over in Proverbs 23. Now, it is associated with eating. It is associated with eating meat, flesh, whatever. But, again, if you didn't know the word, you really wouldn't know what it meant. Uh, you know, ditto for this one here, Proverbs 28. Um uh, and over here in uh, Matthew chapter 11. Yes, it's in contrast to John the Baptist. And maybe it's an extreme sort of thing, but it's kind of hard to, you know, hard to pin down. At least from the context. Okay. So now we, we go some more context. And again, we'll, we'll reveal the left side, then we'll go over to the right side. Okay, here we go. Titus 1.12. Talking about the Cretans. Prophet of their own. Liars. Evil beasts. <coughs> idle gluttons. Now, King James has slow bellies. Now, that gives you a little bit of insight into the underlying Greek. Philippians 3, verse uh, 18 through 19. Uh, Paul speaking. Enemies of Christ. Now, this, this one does not have the word glutton. 
But it does have a word that in other places is translated as glutton. And you'll see it in a moment. Enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is perdition, whose God is the belly. Now that is insightful. And whose glory is their shame, who mind earthly things. Similar reminds us of Romans chapter 18, uh, 16, sorry, Romans 16, 17 through 18. Uh, within the context, it's talking about mock, marking them, causing divisions, occasions of stumbling. Watch it. For they that are such serve, not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. Now, depending on your translation, you might have the word appetite. That's insightful. According to, and these are some quotes from some commentaries that I found, <clears throat> at least according to Titus 1.12, you know, quote-unquote idle gluttons or quote-unquote slow bellies. People whose only concern, now, now watch this, this is, again, insightful, only concern is the stomach, indolent, pampering their bellies, for they themselves are called quote-unquote bellies, for that is the member of the body that they live for. Ah, now we're getting some more insight. Uh, Philippians chapter 3. Again, this is from a commentary. Who worship, again, God, whose God is their belly, who worship their own appetites, live not to adore or an honor God, but for self-indulgence, sensual gratifications, whose supreme happiness lies in gratifying their sensual appetites. That's insightful. Here's another uh, a verse. Kind of related to Romans 16, uh, found on 1 Corinthians 15, verses 32. Again, referring to the resurrection. Uh, within the context, Paul is, is talking about the resurrection. And he says, well, you know, if the dead are not rise, raised, let's just eat and drink and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Again, focus, emphasis. In fact, we were talking about that in our, our class this morning. <clears throat> So from the first set of three or four contexts we looked at, kind of hard to tell. From these contexts, ah, now we're getting a clearer picture. And, and I like some of the words that, that the commentaries use, you know, only concern, pampering, uh, the member for which they live, worship, again, God, worship their appetites, uh, supreme happiness, gratifying their sensual appetites, and at least with under, you know, these two verses here, you know, serving their belly and, you know, if, if dead are not raised, if there's no eternal life, if there's, no, if there's no judgment, hey, let's just party hardy, so to speak, eat and, eat and drink and be merry for tomorrow we die. So now we're starting to get some clearer insight, particularly in terms of gluttony. Now I'm going to quit, I think at this point, um, I have some other material you know, I, I kind of want to reserve for part two. But hopefully at least, and I could go through the rest of it, but we'd probably be here for about another 30, 40 minutes. So this is probably a, a reasonably good place to, to stop. One of the things we have to consider about this and related topics, especially when they're kind of a, a very sensitive, personal, touchy kind of topic, is one of balance, right? As we'll see when we, when we get into part two. Uh, one of balance, one of prudence, one of wise judgment. Because you don't want to go to one extreme or the other. And, and in particular, this subject, we've seen already some misconceptions. We've seen some negative connotations. Uh, you know, we, we need to you know, focus on what the scriptures say and, and not be overly swayed by, you know, uh, culture, misconceptions, myths, uh, perceptions, etc. So we'll kind of leave that as that. Hopefully we'll have part two. Uh, again, I'll talk to Alan and we'll see what he would like to uh, do with respect to that. Now, it, in some ways it's kind of interesting. You know, some people may say, well, the Bible, you know, 2,000 years old, it's ancient, it's archaic. Yeah, doesn't really have that much, you know, bearing on our society today. Well, wrong. <laughs> it does. It is relevant because after all, it was written ultimately, by the Creator. Who knows what's best for us and, and wants to give us, in some ways, not only eternal life, but a relative degree of, you know, hope, comfort, happiness. Now, 
course, all of that is predicated on believing it, following it. And I know we really haven't talked about you know, salvation and such this morning, but we have at least kind of laid a little bit of groundwork for the relevance of the Bible to our everyday lives. Even such a thing as simple as food. One of the things we always do as we close a sermon, service uh, is to quote unquote offer the invitation for those who may need to uh, respond either to become a Christian, uh, to acknowledge indeed Jesus as, well, acknowledge as God, right? The Bible is his word. Jesus as the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God, uh, being willing to repent. And repent of sin, sin is defined in the Bible, uh, willing to confess Jesus as indeed deity, <coughs> be immersed in water in order to become a Christian, in order to have your sins forgiven. Of course, that's just the first part. That's just the beginning. Invitation also for those who have started on that path but may have sinned, your conscience is bothering you, you've done some things you shouldn't have, and if it's a private nature, just go home and take care of it. If it's a public nature, of course, we offer the opportunity to come forward. Uh, or it just can be a time for people to raise a um, uh, degree of concern or visibility, if you will, because of you know ongoing problems that they may have and they want some uh, feedback, encouragement from uh, fellow Christians. That, in essence, or often we describe them three different aspects of the invitation, which we offer at this time. If you need to respond, just come forward, let your needs be known as we stand and say.